My name is Dr. Nasir Khan. I've recently passed my PLAB 2 test. After I passed my PLAB 2, I got registered with the General Medical Council, uh, after which I applied for 181 jobs. I was offered multiple jobs. I chose Portsmouth's Queen Alexandra Hospital to work in the UK. Uh, throughout my journey to the UK, I felt that the road to the UK was very easy. And this is why um, I, I felt it was my responsibility to help and guide others so they could also go through this easy road and find employment and eventually training in the UK. To accomplish this task of guiding others, I decided to make a blog. A lot of you might have seen this blog already. So uh, seeing the positive response that this blog received, I decided to hold career counseling sessions in Karachi. For that, uh, Dr. Simra Siddiqui was very nice to introduce me to patients helping hands. And from there onwards, Dr. Sumbul Murtaza and her team worked tirelessly to arrange today's event. Uh, before I move forwards, we don't have a lot of time today, so I'll try to be quick. If you have any questions, please hold on to them until this session is over. I'll take uh, each and every single question. If you have more questions, you can always post them at my blog, and I respond to all questions. And don't worry, uh, everything that I share here today is already present on my website, on my blog. So if you miss anything, you can always go back to my blog. And so you also don't have to take any pictures of the slides. So let's begin now. But before we begin, I just want you to know that the UK journey is easier than you can imagine. Objectives of today. I want to explain the pathways to the UK. PLAB is not the only pathway. I also want to explain the training system. I want to discuss preparation, how to study for PLAB, and the total expenditure as well. And lastly, to discuss training options in the UK. Now, after we graduate from med school, the first question is, should we work in our home country or should we go abroad? So, home or abroad? Now, let's discuss some pros of working at home. You're close to your friends and family. You have a familiar system at work. You know how things are done. Familiar environment at home as well. Familiar people everywhere. There's help at home. Uh, this is very important because, for example, I'm going to Portsmouth now and I don't know how to cook. So this will be a problem for me. Familiar language. Familiar weather here, a lot of people uh, go to the UK and they get depressed because of the cold. And lastly, this is, uh, if you're thinking long term, if you're working at home, you can have traditional brought up for your children. But pros of working abroad, the training is better, the pay is better, you can have financial independence, a better lifestyle, basic human rights, safety, security, and better working hours as well. I'll discuss this in detail later on. And proper rules and regulations for everything. Now, if you do decide to go abroad, the first question is PLAB or USMLE? Because a lot of you, most people from Dow and SMC prefer USMLE. But I personally, I prefer PLAB, and I'll tell you why. Let's compare them. So, for USMLE, <laughs> more studying, you have to study a lot, from first year, from first year till final year. Uh, USMLE preparation takes more time, PLAB takes less time because you only have your final year subjects, your clinical subjects. Uh, for USMLE, you can, it, it's very difficult to study with a job. For PLAB, it's completely possible. I pass my PLAB on and IELTS during my house job. USMLE exams in general are very difficult, and PLAB exams are easier than our class tests from medical school. <laughs> USMLE has three exams, PLAB has two. Uh, if you do pass your USMLE step one, it's a single shot exam. You cannot take it again. However, uh, you can take PLAB four times if you fail, but most people don't fail PLAB. 
it's not over. Uh, for USMLE, there's a high passing score. Uh, for PLAB, passing score is around 60%, just 6-0, 60%. Uh, in USMLE, scores matter. In PLAB, scores don't matter. So if someone gets 60% and another person gets 99%, both of them would always be equal. No one really cares about your scores. Uh, USMLE costs more. It costs around one and a half to two and a half million Pakistani rupees, which is around 15 to 25 lakhs. PLAB costs around half a million to a million, which is five to 10 lakh Pakistani rupees. Uh, after you pass your USMLE, uh, around 52% IMGs got a match last year. Compared to that, everyone who passes PLAB gets a job, everyone. Uh, in USMLE, your local exposure in the US counts. So if you've done uh, clinical attachments or electives in the US, it matters a lot. For PLAB, it really doesn't matter. I didn't have any clinical attachments in the UK, and I still got multiple job offers. In USMLE, since the preparation takes a long time, your, it takes you time to get your first job in the US. Compared to that, uh, most people uh, start working in the UK a year or two after their graduation. So it takes less time. And lastly, uh, you know how the visa policy is. I won't say much. <laughs> now let's compare living or working in the US versus living or working in the UK. Starting salary in the US is around $3,200. In the UK, it's around 2,700 pounds. If you convert $3,200 to pounds, it's around 2,600 pounds. So the salary for junior doctors is nearly the same. US and UK are paying nearly the same to junior doctors. USA has difficult working hours, just like Pakistan. The UK has very easy working hours, and I will discuss this in detail in a bit. The USA has arguably better training, the UK also has pretty good training, but maybe US has better training system. The USA has shorter training, four to five years. The UK's training is around three to eight years. So in general, the UK's training, the training pathway is longer. Uh, in the US, your first job is a training job. So you begin your career with a training job. It's not like that in the UK. Your first job in the UK is almost always a non-training job and you later switch on to a training job. A lot of people ask me what is a training job and what is a non-training job. So your house job or your residency in Pakistan is a training job because you're training to move forwards. And if you're working as an MO or an RMO in Pakistan, that's a non-training job because there's no career progression. So that's the difference between a training and a non-training job. And lastly, the US is not a welfare state, the UK is. And again, it makes a big difference in my opinion and I'll tell you why later on. So if you do decide to go abroad, uh, and if you do decide to go to the UK, I want to explain the UK's training system. But before that, I want to explain Pakistan's training system, because most of you might know this, but maybe not all of you. So after you graduate from medical school in Pakistan, the next step is your house job. After your house job, most people would take RMO or MO jobs during which they pass their FCPS1. Uh, however, a lot of people pass their FCPS1 during their house job as well. So they don't have to go through the RMO or MO pathway. They can just take their FCPS1 and begin their residency. And res residency one and two, which means the first two years of residency, after which you take another exam, which is known as IMM, intermediate module. After that, you continue the remaining two or three years of your residency. So that's four to five years of your residency training. After that, you take your FCPS2 exam. And once you've passed your FCPS2, you're now a consultant in Pakistan. So house job, FCPS1, and then your residency, and uh, then FCPS2 to complete your training, and then you're a consultant. Now let's look at the UK's training pathway. After you graduate from medical school, the next step is FY1 and FY2, which is their version of house job, foundation year one and foundation year two. So house job is known as foundation year in the UK. 
and instead of one, it is for two years. So two years of house job or foundation year in the UK. After that, you have a lot of options. The first option is, which most people take, is CT1 and 2 or ST1 and 2, which means two years of core training or specialty training. This is for medicine and surgery and psychiatry. Most, most Pakistanis go for core medical training. So two years of core medical training. And then three more years. After two years, you again have to apply for training at ST3 level, specialty training three. And it ends at specialty training eight. So two years of core training and six years of specialty training. So two plus six, that, that's eight years of training to become a consultant in medicine or surgery. But this is not the only pathway. There's another pathway by the name of run-through training. The difference is that once you enter your run-through training, you don't have to enter any other training again. Uh, once you enter your training, you are going to become a consultant after eight years. Uh, run-through training is not available in medicine. It is available in a few other specialties. I'll tell you which ones in a bit. But there's another pathway. This is my favorite one. GP specialty training one, general physician specialty training, which is uh, in Pakistan and in the US, it's known as family medicine. So the good thing is that after three years, you become a consultant. You're a GP, which is a consultant in the UK. So only three years of training. And uh, it's, it's very attractive because there are, uh, once you're a consultant, there are no nights, no weekends. Uh, very easy working hours, and the pay is really good as well. So these are the three most common pathways. There are, to be honest, there are other pathways as well, but these are the three most common pathways which people take. And after all of these, you're a consultant. Now run through specialties. Uh, clinical radiology, neurosurgery, OBGYN, ophthalmology, and pediatrics. So run through training is available in these specialties and a few more less common ones. Now let's talk about the pathways for working in the UK. Like I said before, PLAB is not the only pathway. FCPS, PLAB and MRCP, there are three basic pathways. Let's talk about FCPS first. For trainees, Trainees are people who are uh, going through their residency training, who have passed their FCPS1 and are currently going through their residency training. There's a program by the name of Medical Training Initiative, MTI. Uh, through this program, you can exchange two years of your Pakistani training for training in the UK. For example, if I pass FCPS1 and I complete my first year of residency in Pakistan, I can complete my second and third year of residency training in the UK and then come back to Pakistan and then continue my training here. So this is ideal for people who want to work in the UK for a short time, who want to gain exposure and then come back to Pakistan. For people who have passed FCPS2 and are consultants, uh, if you're a consultant in pediatrics or anesthesiology, uh, your, your training is recognized in the UK. So you can be a consultant in the UK based on your FCPS in pediatrics or anesthesiology. If you have completed your residency training in Pakistan in any other specialty, there's a pathway known as CESR. Through this pathway, you can again apply for uh, specialty registration in the UK, which simply means you can be a consultant in the UK if you've, uh, if you've completed your FCPS part two. They check your documents and everything. It's a long process, but I know a Pakistani consultant who has recently become a consultant in the UK through the CESR pathway. Now, the, the second option, PLAB, which is my favorite. Uh, PLAB has two parts, PLAB 1 and PLAB 2. Now, uh, if if you plan on going for PLAB, it's very important that you complete your internship or your house job in Pakistan. And for your internship, you need to have 
a complete 12 months of internship, 365 days, not one day less, with at least three months in medicine and at least three months in surgery. And you can choose your subspecialties like pediatrics, OBGYN, psychiatry, based on your future interests. Now, why is internship important? I'll tell you why. Because if you enter the UK system without completing your house job in Pakistan, after you're done with your PLAB, you, since you have not done your house job in Pakistan, you can only enter through FY1, which is the UK's house job. And for us who are not British nationals, it is not impossible, but very difficult to enter through FY1. Because most of the UK graduates who graduate from medical school enter into FY1, and there's almost no vacancies for us. So from there onwards, the pathway is the same. Core training, specialty training, run through training, GPST, and you become a consultant. Now, compared to this, people who complete their internship in Pakistan, like I did, after their PLAB, since they've completed their internship in Pakistan, they don't have to go through FY1 and FY2 in the UK. They can enter the system through SHO, Senior House Officer, which is basically UK's equivalent of RMO or MO. So it's a non-training job, and you can enter the system and you don't have to go through FY1 and FY2. And after your SHO, the pathway is the same. Core training, specialty training, run through training, GP training, and you're a consultant then. So if you complete your internship or house job in Pakistan, what you're basically doing is, you're skipping your FY1 and FY2 because you've, you've done that in Pakistan, and you can begin your career with an SHO job. And this is, this is the most common route, this is the route that most people take. So please do complete your internship in Pakistan, 12 months of internship, three months in medicine, three in surgery, and subspecialties based on future interests. Now, the UK MLA. A lot of people ask questions about this. What is UK MLA? Uh, a few years from now, the PLAB exam is going to end, and it's going to be replaced by the UK MLA. Uh, there was a consultation done recently, this year, to determine when and how the UK MLA should begin. And the results would be out on the final day of this year. So you have to wait until this year ends to find out when and how the UK MLA is going to be implemented. But according to the GMC's website, it would probably begin somewhere around 2022, five years from now. But it's very important to keep an eye on the news, to know what's going on. Full implementation, like I said, by 2022. The UKML is also going to have two parts, just like PLAB 1. Part 1 would have MCQs, just like PLAB 1. Part 2 would have OSCE exam, just like PLAB 2. And actually, the website also says that the question bank is going to be similar, if not the same. So uh, if you're in first year or second year and you're afraid that you might have to take the UK MLA, there's, there's no reason to be afraid because the UK is short of doctors and they need doctors. So they're not going to make this hard for us because they need us. Please closely follow the news for recent updates about the UK MLA. Now the third pathway, MRCP. A lot of Pakistanis prefer this pathway uh, it has, MRCP has three parts, MRCP1, MRCP2, which are both uh, theory exams, and then PACES, which is a clinical exam. MRCP1 and 2 are held in Karachi, but for PACES, you have to go abroad. Now, entry into the training after MRCP. If you pass your MRCP, you don't have to go through PLAB. You can directly begin your uh, work or training in the UK. After your MRCP, the next step is REG or Registrar, which is basically a non-training job at ST3 level. So it's, uh, if you've done your MRCP, you can say that you've bypassed your core training, two years of core training, because after your job as a Registrar, the next step is ST3 and ST8. So if you complete your MRCP, 
what you're basically doing is you're skipping your two years of core training. I hope this makes sense. Now, important question. If I, if I pass PLAB, do I need to take MRCP? Well, if you want to become a consultant in medicine, then yes, you have to take MRCP, even after you pass your PLAB. Uh, because uh, MRCP is a prerequisite for entering ST3. So anyone who enters ST3 level has to pass their MRCP. If you pass your MRCP, do you need to pass your PLAB? No, you don't. If you pass your MRCP, you can skip your PLAB, you can skip your core training as well. So MRCP sounds better then. Why not go for MRCP? Because you can skip core training, you can skip PLAB as well. So why not go for, why not go for MRCP? Again, for MRCP, you have to study a lot. For PLAB, you don't have to study much. MRCP takes time, PLAB doesn't. It's difficult to study for MRCP with a job. It's completely possible to study for PLAB with a job. MRCP is a difficult exam, to be honest, especially the final part, PACES, which is a clinical exam. It's difficult to pass PACES without having worked in the UK. PLAB is very easy. You can pass PLAB even if you've never worked in the UK, just like I did, and most people do. MRCP has three exams, PLAB has two, and again, MRCP costs more than PLAB. MRCP costs around 20 to 50% more than PLAB. Um, I like this diagram. Uh, imagine you standing at ground level. It's very easy to climb the PLAB journey because you're beginning from the ground. After your PLAB, once, you've, once, you've, once you're done with your PLAB, it's very easy to enter your core training. And during your core training, again, since you've worked in the UK for a while, you're in the system, MRCP then becomes easy. But imagine you standing at the ground and trying to jump at MRCP. That becomes difficult. It's not impossible. A lot of people do this. But it's difficult. And to be honest, it takes a lot of time as well. So it's just easier and better to go through PLAB, core training, and then MRCP. It takes less time. OK, uh, now let's talk about PLAB. But a lot of you here have not yet graduated. So a lot of people ask me what they can do before their graduation. So there's a lot that you can do before your graduation. Number one, audits. If you don't know what audit is, audit is when you compare uh, current practices at your workplace with standard practices to check if things are being done the way that they're supposed to. And you publish a report based on that. So that is an audit. Research projects, they help. Quality improvement projects. If you introduce anything new to your workplace which improves the quality of your workplace, that is a quality improvement project. BSc or BA degrees. When you apply for core training, there's around five to 10 marks for your BSc and BA degrees. So people who are in their first year or second year, if you can uh, get an additional degree of BSc or BA, it's going to help. Doesn't make a big difference if you don't have it. <laughs> Journal publications help. Poster presentations help. Oral presentations, any presentation that you give during your med school or, or your house job, uh, get a certificate signed for it. It counts. Teaching experience, formal or informal. So even if you teach your classmates, that's an informal teaching experience. It counts. Even if you teach your patients, that experience counts. Any teaching experience counts. But you need documentary evidence for everything. Otherwise, it doesn't count. So how would you provide documentary evidence for informal teaching? By using feedback forms. You, you, you can give feedback forms to your students. They can fill them out for you. And that would be your evidence for your teaching experience. Clinical attachments in the UK, they help as well. 
uh, any courses, any seminars, any workshops, all of this helps. Any voluntary work helps. Again, you need to have documentary evidence for it, a certificate. Leadership and or managerial roles. For example, if you've been your class captain of your football team or, or anything, if, for example, you're working at Patients Helping Hands, all of this counts as leadership or managerial roles. Any other extracurricular ac activity, again, you need proof for this. Electives abroad or electives in your home country. But please don't get scared by this. I didn't have any of this. <laughs> and I still got multiple job offers. And most people don't have this. And most people still get jobs. So all of this just adds a cherry on the top, but it's not very important. Because the UK is so short of doctors that all of you will find jobs. This is for additional benefit, but if you don't have this, nothing to worry about. I didn't have any of this, so don't worry. Most people don't have any of this. Uh, to be honest, the most important thing when you apply for your job is your recent clinical experience. So it's important to have employment, to always work. During your house job and even after your house job finishes, please continue working. Don't stop working. Work as an MO, RMO, as a resident, but please keep working. Because that is what's going to get you your first job in the UK. Because whenever you apply for your job, they ask if you've been working. And if you have been working, they feel comfortable uh, letting you work at their hospital. But if you have not been working recently in your own country, then they don't feel comfortable letting you work at their hospital. So more important than any of this is your clinical experience in Pakistan. Don't stop working, please. Don't take, don't take breaks. Now, roadmap for PLAB. The first step is your visa homework. And a lot of people make this mistake of not doing their homework. I made this mistake as well, and I ended up going through two visa rejections because of this. The ideal time to begin your visa homework is six months before you graduate. Six months before you graduate. Next step is take your IELTS. Again, roughly six months before you graduate. If you've already graduated, please take it as soon as possible. After IELTS, you go through PLAB 1. Uh, you cannot take PLAB 1 if you have not passed your IELTS. Then you apply for your PLAB 2 visa because PLAB 1 is held in Karachi. PLAB 2 is only held in Manchester. So you need a visa to take your PLAB 2. Then take your PLAB 2. Then apply for GMC registration. GMC is UK's equivalent of PMDC. It is their local medical body. So after you pass your PLAB 2, you apply for GMC registration. This is just a formality, GMC registration. And then you begin working in the UK. Now let's talk about your visa homework. It's pretty simple. Like I said, you need to be employed to get your visa because employment counts as a strong home tie. It gives you a reason to come back to Pakistan. If you're not employed, you can still get your visa, people do, but it's, very, it's difficult to get a visa if you're not employed. So again, please keep working in Pakistan as long as you're in Pakistan. Uh, it's very important to have salary or income during your work in Pakistan. So uh, a lot of people are not paid during their house jobs, but it's important that you choose a house job which gives you income because it, again, it counts as a strong home tie. You need to have a bank account. So uh, if any of you does not have a bank account, please get a bank account as soon as possible. And you need to have around 3,000 pounds, which is around four to five lakh Pakistani rupees in your account when you apply for your visa. So this is your visa homework. You don't actually have to do anything. You just have to be careful about a few things. You need to be employed. You need to have income. You need to have a bank account. And you need to have around 4 to 5 lakh Pakistani rupees in your bank account. And you should make sure that you begin this homework roughly six months before you graduate. 
Next step is IELTS. You can take IELTS through British Council or Australian Education Office. Uh, the only difference is that AEO has local Pakistani uh, examiners for their speaking part of the test. So people feel more comfortable taking IELTS through AEO. I myself took IELTS through AEO. But it really, it really doesn't make a big difference. Requirement for IELTS. IELTS has four sections, listening, reading, writing, and speaking. You need to score at least seven in each of these, and at least seven and a half overall. And if your English is good or decent, you can score this easily. I scored 8.0 in IELTS. Uh, there are two kinds of IELTS, IELTS Academic and IELTS UKVI Academic. It's better to take IELTS UKVI Academic, but both of these are, uh, would let you qualify for PLAB 1. But uh, when you apply for your work visa, uh, you will need UKVI Academic. So please take IELTS UKVI Academic. There's no difference between these two IELTS. The only difference is that UKVI costs around 10,000 Pakistani rupees more, and it has extra camera surveillance. These are the only differences. So please take IELTS UKVI Academic. Now, studying for IELTS, you just need to go through these 11 Cambridge books. And they don't have uh, any theory or study material, they just have practice tests. So all you have to do for your IELTS is practice through the past tests, through these 11 books. And in my opinion, this is more than enough for IELTS. And it takes people a month or two to prepare for IELTS. I took six weeks. Because uh, listening and reading take around two, three days, but writing takes around four to eight weeks. Writing takes time to practice. This is all about IELTS. Now, to qualify for PLAB 1, you need to graduate. You cannot take PLAB 1 before graduating. But as soon as you pass your MBBS, you can take PLAB 1. You also need IELTS for PLAB 1. You don't need house job for PLAB 1. You don't. But still, it's best to go through house job for the reasons that I mentioned already. And it's best to take your PLAB 1 during your house job. I took PLAB 1 during, your, during my house job. And PLAB 1 was so easy that it was very easy for me to manage. Now, PLAB 1, it only has clinical subjects. Medicine, surgery, gynae ops, pediatric, psychiatry, ENT, ophthalmology, uh, but 90 to 95 percent of the exam is from medicine. It has 200 single best answer questions, so 200 MCQs, only 200. The passing score varies around 60 to 65 percent, and like I said, uh, someone who scores 65 and someone who scores 99, both of them would always be equal. Scores don't matter. My score was around uh, 131, so 65%. Like I said, scores don't matter. Uh, PLAB 1 is held in Karachi and Islamabad in March and November. It's also held in the UK in June and September, but it's best to take it in Karachi in March or November. Uh, it costs around 31,000 Pakistani rupees, 230 British pounds. So it's not very expensive. Now, study material for PLAB 1. These two are the most important files. The first file has 1,700 questions. The second file has seven mock tests. Each mock has 200 questions because it's a mock, so each mock has 200, seven mocks would have 1,400. So this is a total of 3,100 questions. Most people just practice these 3,100 questions and pass their exams. I know people who practiced just 1,700 questions and passed their exam. I know people who, pa who studied just 1,000 questions from 1,700 and passed their exams. And I'm talking about average students, not brilliant class toppers, average students. I also know people who went through seven mocks and passed their exam. So these are the uh, two most important files. 
Next, you have Samson's notes. You can find all of this on Facebook. Don't worry about it. Uh, I went through Samson's notes once. I read them once. I did not memorize them. I just read them once. And uh, to be honest, I don't think you need to stress upon notes. You need to focus on questions, solving questions, practicing questions. Uh, people, a lot of people make this mistake of reading notes and focusing too much on the notes. And they end up scoring low or failing the exam. So it's important to focus on the questions, not on the notes. If you have confusions about any questions, if you're not sure about the answer, go to patient.co.uk and uh, find out information, find out if the answer is correct or not. Uh, apart from 1707 mocks, patient.co.uk should be your first source of information to check anything. Apart from that, check Oxford Handbook of Clinical Medicine. Again, only if you get stuck anywhere, if you're not sure about any answer, open Oxford Handbook only then. Don't study Oxford Handbook cover to cover. A lot of people make this mistake. I also made this mistake. I, studied, I tried to study from it cover to cover. But then when I started solving questions, I realized that questions were completely different. And studying from Oxford made no difference. So please do not waste your time on Oxford. Solve questions. Not, don't go through notes or don't, uh, you can go through notes, but don't, don't spend too much time, time on them. Don't, don't waste too much energy on notes or Oxford. Recalls. You can find recalls for every exam. Go through recalls. And once you go through recalls, it will help you realize that questions are being repeated in the exam. And it will give you a lot of confidence. Uh, I went through recalls uh, around 10 days before my exam. And I realized that I knew all the questions. And it made me feel really good. I felt that I could take this exam and pass it easily. More study material. A lot of you might be aware of Dr. Khalid's questions. Now, what Dr. Khalid has done is he has explained answers to the 1,700 questions. These are the same questions with Dr. Khalid's explanations. These are very short, precise, and useful explanations. When I took my PLAB one, these explanations were not available. And to be honest, I did not feel that I need them either. So uh, you can go through them. But even if you don't go through them, you can still pass your exam very comfortably. Uh, there's a website by the name of Plabable. It's plabable.com. Uh, they have, again, explained the same 1,700 questions. They have their own explanations. You can go there. Uh, when I took my exam, Plabable was not available, but I hear really nice reviews from people about Plabable. Unity's notes, again, they've explained the same 1,700 questions with their explanations. Their explanations are, to be honest, very lengthy. And again, I, you can go through them if you like. But again, I think it's important to focus on the questions and not explanations on the or theory or notes. Focus on questions, not explanations. Past medicine has their own question bank of around 2,000 questions. But to be honest, their questions are very difficult. Plab 1's questions are very easy. Samson has his own question bank. His question bank is very useful. But to be honest, it's very expensive. I used it in my time because it was very cheap. But now it's very expensive. You can still subscribe to it if you want. Uh, clinchers are basically, uh, it's a file of one-liners, which are very useful. And I, I went through clinchers, uh, it, uh, the, only the first few pages, first one or two pages. But then I just decided to focus on the questions. But a lot of people find clinchers useful. So I thought it was worth mentioning here. More help for, plabable, for plab. Uh, if you haven't already joined the Facebook PLAB group, please join it now. Uh, this is the most useful source of information. You, you will find everything on this group. When I started my journey, I did not know anything about PLAB. Everything I know about PLAB today is from this Facebook group. Go through the files section of this group, and you will find all the study material that I've mentioned before. You'll find everything here. 
if you haven't already been to my blog, you can go to my blog and you'll find all the study material and all the uh, advice there as well. So it's, it's a useful source of information. A lot of people prefer WhatsApp groups. They make uh, small WhatsApp groups of five to, tell pe five to 10 people and then they study together. So it helps them. I did not join any group, but a lot of people do. And a lot of people join academies for PLAB1. I did not. And I don't think that you need to join an academy for PLAB1 because the exam is so easy. All the study material is out there. Please don't waste your time, energy, or money on joining an academy for PLAB1. And most academies for PLAB1 are in the UK, to be honest, not in Karachi. Now let's talk about my PLAB1. It was the easiest exam of my life. <laughs> it was, trust me when I say this, it was easier than my class test from medical school. And I am not someone who was very brilliant at studies. I failed more than half of my class tests in medical school. I, I never passed my uh, mock examinations. So, but I still found PLAB1 very easy. I'll tell you why. I, I did not even study hard for it. I took advice from people who had recently taken the exam. I studied on the go. What I mean by this is I downloaded 1,700 questions on my phone. And before breakfast, I used to go through five questions. During breakfast, five questions. On my way to work, 20 more questions. Reached hospital waiting for my consultant, five more questions. So by the time that I used to get home from work during my house job, I would have gone through 100 to 150 questions or 100 to 200 questions already. If I had not completed my daily target, I would sit down for an hour or half and I would complete my daily target. So I, to be honest, I never studied after 5 p.m. I used to watch three to four hours of TV shows every day. That's how I studied. <laughs> And it's not because I'm brilliant, it's just that the exam is easy. You, you have to study smart for it. You should know where to study from, how to study, and <laughs> download these questions on your phone and keep going through them throughout your day. The questions are very easy, very, very easy. Now let's talk about Visa for PLAB2. It's very important to take it seriously. I made this mistake. I did not take it seriously. And I ended up having two visa rejections because of my own mistakes. And I don't want you guys to go through this. It's very important to plan things. Uh, like I said, your visa homework is your first step. So plan things accordingly. And it's important to have documentary evidence. Anything that you state in your visa application has to be backed up by documentary evidence. For example, if you say that you're working in Karachi, you need to attach your employment letter or your experience letter to show that you're working in Karachi. Anything that you say has to be backed up by evidence. Write a nice cover letter for your application. Uh, if you want guidance as to how to write your cover letter, go to my blog and you'll find out how to write a cover letter, and you'll find all the other guidance as well for your visa. It's very important to take it seriously, to plan things. Go to my website and try to find out uh, what mistakes I made and how I overcame them and what you guys should be careful about. And lastly, don't rush for your visa. Take your time, plan things, and when you're sure that you're ready for your visa application, then apply for it. Now let's talk about PLAB2. It's an OSCE-based exam. It has 18 OSCE stations. Passing score is only around 48 to 53%. Can you get a low passing score than this? It's so easy. And again, scores don't matter. So you can score, you can score uh, 216, and I can score 110 and both of us would have equal job opportunities. Scores don't matter. It's only held in Manchester. That's why you need a visa for it. 
it costs around 113,000 Pakistani rupees. Now, in 18 stations, each station has three parts, and each part has four marks. First part is data gathering, which means history taking. So history taking has around four marks. Management has four marks. Interpersonal skills has four marks. And in my opinion, the third part is the most important part. Because let's say you forget any station, so you don't take a proper history. Even if you don't take a proper history, you'll still ask something at least. So you'll still score at least one or two out of four. Even if you forget your management, you'll still score at least one or two out of your management. So that's one or two from history, one or two from management. And as long as you're nice and polite, as long as you say sorry, please, thank you, kindly, as long as you're very nice, you'll, you'll score four out of four in interpersonal skills. So you don't have to remember anything for interpersonal skills. You just have to be nice. And I was told when I was studying that the way that I talk is soft, so it's going to help me in my exam. And it did help me in my exam. I ended up scoring 155 in my exam, which was a pretty high score. So let's say you mess up your history taking and management, and you do well in your interpersonal skills. So that's four from interpersonal skills, one or two from each of these, so that's a total of six to eight. And you only need to score six to pass. So as long as you're nice, even if you forget your history and management, you'll still pass the station and the exam as well. So that, that's why I say it's a very easy exam. As long as you're nice, you cannot fail this. Uh, PLAB 2 has a lot of academies. These three are the most famous or the most common ones. I went to Dr. Hamid's common stations. Uh, you should do your own homework. Go to Facebook, check their reviews, and make your decision based on reviews. You'll find all of this on my blog as well. My PLAB 2. Now, this was the second most easiest exam of my life. <laughs> I followed my teacher's advice. I followed him blindly, and it helped me. Again, I did not study hard. <laughs> I took advice from people who had recently taken the exam. And to be honest, I studied just two to three weeks seriously. And I passed very comfortably. So you don't have to study a lot. Most people study for two to four weeks. Uh, ideally, you should keep four weeks for PLAB 2. After you've passed your PLAB 2, the next step is GMC registration. It's just a formality. They check your documents. and they invite you for an ID check appointment, they take a picture, they take your fingerprints, and then, you're giving, and then you're given the license to work in the UK. The next step is employment in the UK. I applied for 181 jobs. Can you imagine applying for 181 jobs in Pakistan? Oh, I cannot. After I completed my internship in Pakistan, I applied for five, six jobs in Pakistan. But in the UK, the system is so nice and easy that you can sit at your home go to one centralized website and apply all over the UK from one single website, sitting at your home, even from Karachi. I had 22 interview offers. I attended only eight, seven of which were on Skype. I got four job offers. Now, uh, once, you get a, uh, once you pass your PLAB 2 and you begin working in the UK, you have two options. NHS, which is the government setup, and ES, which is a private setup. Most people go for NHS because NHS has career progression. It has a training program. It lets you become a consultant. The training program, which I described earlier, was from NHS. NES does not have a training program. So if, if, you, if you're working in the NES, you would work as an SHO for as long as you're in the NES. NHS, since it's, it has a training program, it's more valued experience. NES is less valued. NHS has standard working hours. NES has a very interesting schedule. You work one week, so for one whole week, you're at work. You sleep at the hospital. And then the next whole week is off for you, so you can go for vacations. 
So people who are not planning on working on long-term basis, they, they can go for NES because NES pays very handsomely compared to the NHS. And you can work for a week and the next week, the whole week is off, so you can take a break. But if you plan on becoming a consultant, go for NHS. Now, let's talk about total expenditure on PLAB. This is around four to 6,000 pounds. It's around five to eight lakh rupees. This includes your exam fees, your IELTS fees, your, your plane ticket to the UK, your living expenses in the UK, your traveling expenses in the UK. It includes everything, everything. Five to eight lakh rupees. This is why I said it's uh, not as expensive as the USMLE. Now, after you're done with your PLAB and you're at the stage at, at which I am right now, that you have to go to the UK to begin your first job, uh, you'll get your first paycheck at the end of the month. So you again, you need expenses to go through the first month before you get your first paycheck. And that is around four to six and a half lakh Pakistani rupees, uh, three to 5,000 pounds. Uh, again, this includes everything, your ticket, your uh, living expenses, everything. But to be honest, this three to 5,000 pounds does not feel much because uh, at the end of the first month, you do get your first pay, which is around 3,000 pounds. So uh, this total expenditure on moving to the UK uh, does not feel heavy. Let's talk about pay skills. How much do you get paid in the UK? If you're working without nights, it's around 2,000 pounds roughly, which is around two and a half lakh Pakistani rupees. But to be honest, you might not always have this option of working without nights. Most people do have to, uh, do have to work nights as well. So if you're doing nights, it's around 2,700 pounds, which is around three and a half lakh Pakistani rupees. So that's why I say you get your first paycheck at the end of the month. So it doesn't feel heavy, the, the expenses on traveling to the UK. This is my favorite part, working hours in the UK. Before we talk about this, I'm sure all of you know that working hours in Pakistan are like eight hours every day. And then you have uh, your on-call duty every third or fourth day, which is around 24 to 36 hours every third or fourth day. So you reach work at nine in the morning and you're free the next morning, afternoon or evening. It's a very long duty. The UK also has an eight hour day. You reach at work at nine in the morning, you get free at five in the evening. Five days a week, Saturdays are off. So you can enjoy your two day weekend. So you only have to work 40 to 48 hours per week, depending on which department you're working in, 40 to 48 hours. My contract says I'll be working 40 hours per week. Most contracts are for 40 hours per week. The longest shift is for 12 hours. The longest shift is for 12 hours. So you reach at work at nine in the morning, you get free at nine at night. You don't have to work for more than 12 hours. It can be from nine at night to nine in the morning as well. And you get compensatory off for your night shift. For example, if I did 12 hours today, uh, instead of eight, I might have to do four hours tomorrow to make sure that I don't work more, more than 40 hours per week. So the working hours are pretty relaxed, to be honest. They're very nice because they expect you to be a human being and work like a human being. They don't, they don't want you to be sleepy at work. Taxation in the UK, the tax is around 17 to 25%. It, if it feels a lot to you, I'll tell you why it's not a lot. Because you get a lot of privileges, I'll tell you. Now, let's try to summarize this. The exams are very easy, I've told you why. The journey is very short because you can take PLAB 1 and 2 very quickly. Uh, preparation for PLAB 1 takes around, uh, it's best if you give it three to four months, but I've seen people pass PLAB 1, average people, I've seen them pass 
with two weeks of preparation as well. Because you only have to go through the 1,700 or 3,000 questions. So it's a very short journey. Uh, since the UK is so short of doctors, there are countless jobs. I don't know anyone who's passed their PLAB and is jobless in the UK, if they have recent clinical experience. If people who don't have recent clinical experience do find it hard to find employment, uh, to find their first job in the UK. The UK has great pay, like I've said. It's uh, just the same as the, the US. Uh, the IMG community in the UK is very helpful. Uh, Pakistanis there are very nice. A lot of you might know Dr. Umar Alam from Umar's Guidelines. Now, he has formed a community of Pakistanis who, uh, who stay together, who help, who help each other, who, who support each other. So even if you don't have your family in the UK, the IMG community does feel like a family. So you'll never be alone in the UK. And lastly, if you, after working in the UK for three to four years, you can move to Australia, New Zealand, Middle East. So you have your other options open as well. Now, let's talk about the UK. It's unlike the US, it's a welfare state. Now, what do I mean by a welfare state? A welfare state means that the state looks after its people. It means that healthcare and education are free. When I say healthcare is free, most people think that hospital admissions are free, medications are free, take home medications are free, but that's it. But I'll tell you, I'll give you an example. When I was studying for PLAP2, I had a friend with me. Uh, her uncle had a heart attack. So her uncle went to the hospital. When he was being discharged, the hospital found out that his home was slightly uphill. And since he had a heart attack recently, it was not easy for him to climb. So the government installed railing on that pathway so he could hold on to that railing and climb the pathway. The government installed that on their expenses. And uh, in his home, his bedroom was on the first floor and his kitchen and washroom were on the ground floor. So the government installed a chairlift for him to move up and down the stairs. So when I say free healthcare, that is what it means. That is what a welfare state is. And again, the US has a very expensive healthcare system, so I think it was worth mentioning. After working in the UK for six years, you get nationality. So you're a British national in six years. And even when you're not a national, you still have free education for your student, for your uh, children, and free healthcare as well, even when you're not a national. Uh, that was it. Lastly, um, if any of you has any questions, you can ask me right now. If you have questions later on, you can always go to my website. You can post questions there. I reply to each and every single question. It might take me some time, but I reply to all questions. And uh, now we'll begin our next session, which is the Q&A session. If any of you has any questions, feel free to ask. Thank you.